I've been waiting for you to come because I wanted to ask this question. And thank you, Warren, for calling it in. Please explain who Allah is. Some people say he is the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You've even seen it on some of the Christian television stations that says that. Well, Allah has 99 names in the Quran. And a couple of his names, one of them is the destroyer. And one of them who does damage, does mischief. Uh, Adar. Uh, so uh, these cannot be attributes of God. God is not the destroyer in the, in, the, in the Bible. Allah is a religion that was there, the worship of Allah, was there before Muhammad was even born. Remember, his name is Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim. He is Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, the servant of Allah. So how could have Muhammad introduced Allah if his father's name is the slave of Allah? You see, it's a Babylonian religion. You have to understand uh, Nabuchad Nasr, Nebuchadnezzar, his son Nebunidus uh, came to Arabia. He came to Yathrib, since you mentioned Yathrib. He came to Yathribu, look at the oracles of Nebunidus. And he established the worship of Murdukh, which did not work. It, it was not palatable to the Arabs. Uh, so then he introduced the worship of the moon god, and that flourished in Arabia. That's why it's called the daughter of Babylon. That's why Arabia is a daughter of Babylon. Uh, so you had the introduction from Babylonian religion. It's a Babylonian religion. And if you look at like, like people in, in, in the Bible uh, regarding the Antichrist, regarding Gog, let's say. Gog is, a, we always ask, who is Gog? Gog is a reference to a real historical figure. His name was Gaigez, Gugu. He was from Lydia, which is Turkey. He worshipped the god Men, which is the moon god. So the establishment of the moon god was, came from the eons of time. And most Muslims don't know why the moon god is there. It's and the it, crescent moon on all the flags, the minarets, and so forth. It's all over, the symbol of the, of the crescent moon. Yes. Uh, uh, even if you look at the Hebrew word in, 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 Isaiah, in Isaiah, where it talks about the five eyes, his name is the word Lucifer. Go to the Hebrew. It's Hilal ben Sahar, Hilal the brightness. Hilal is also an Arab word, which means crescent moon, by the way. Really? So there's a connection there. There's a Babylonian connection of Islam. It's one of the many Babylonian religions. Uh, it, it is totally foreign to the Bible. This is why I was astonished when I started looking at the Bible. It says there's two different gods. One God hates Jews, one God loves Jews. Uh, one God says, hey, we should not unite the world under one language. Uh, Babylon, you know, was, you know, from, mm -hmm. from that moment on, God changed the language. Uh, Islam wants to unite the world under one language, under one religion, one culture, one, one entity. This is not from the Bible. So uh, let me step in here. Sorry, <laughs> that's okay. Um, look, I don't know of a a translation of the Bible into uh, Arabic that does not have Allah as God. Okay. Now, how's that going to work? The Quran says Allah is not a father, and He does not have a son. So how are you going to have John three sixteen? in this Arabic Bible. For Allah so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The Quran, he can give you the verses, says you believe in the Trinity, you go to hell. But the Bible is a triune God. Allah was the chief idol in the Kaaba. There were 300 and some idols. And Muhammad smashed them, but he kept the same, the name of Allah. It's the same God uh, that they had before. Nothing changed. The Hajj, uh, the ha you know, the sacred pilgrimage, it didn't change, did it? They practiced it, the pagan Arabs, for centuries before Muhammad was born. Uh, well, I mean, there's so many details, we don't have time. The, the, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, the most important treaty, when Muhammad comes, this is incredible. He's, he's started this Muslim religion, supposedly. And he's living in Medina now. And he comes in 628 AD with his followers. These are new Muslims now. And they come to Mecca. What do they want to go do? They want to join the Hajj. What is the Hajj? They're going to go to this Kaaba. Got 300 and some idols. And Allah is the chief idol. And they want to join the pagans and go around. Okay, that's when Mecca was too strong. They stopped him. And he entered into this treaty of Hudaybiyah, 
the most important treaty, I guess, in Islamic history, because it set the law of war and peace, uh, it, it established a hudna. And these guys are not talking about peace, they're talking about a hudna, a temporary ceasefire so we can gather our strength to destroy you, okay? So, but as part of that deal, Muhammad got to come then the next year, 629. Here he comes. These are Muslims. This is Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. And they join the pagans. They go seven times. Did you ever go on that pilgrimage? No. My father did. Yeah. Go seven times around the Kaaba, kiss the dark stone, touch the stone in the Imani corner, run between Marwa and Safi, you know, go to Wadi Mina. Every year they get trampled to death over there mm -hmm. and throw seven rocks each at each of seven effigies of Satan, supposedly. All of the pagan ceremonies that were established before Muhammad was born, the Muslims do them today. Only thing they changed was, instead of Allah being the chief God in the Kaaba, Allah is the only God, and if you don't admit that, we kill you, okay? Mm -hmm. The uh, Ramadan is the same thing. It's the same pagan ceremony. The Quran says, you could probably tell us the verse, that the Quran was first inspired in the month of Ramadan, right? Which says Ramadan already existed. And it was to Maybe be... I could recite the verse. Yeah, okay. إِنَّ أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ we have descended the Quran to thee in the night of vision. What do you know what the night of vision is? Laylatul Qadr khayrun min alfi shahr. It is the night of vision that this Quran supposedly came down. That's when the crescent moon shows up. It's better than a thousand months. Tanazzalu al malaikatu fiha wa ruhu bi izni rabbihim. It's the day when the angelic host is cast out of heaven by the order of their Lord. Who is their Lord? And when are the angelic host cast out of heaven? This is, this is in the Bible, the, angel, the mm -hmm. demonic force. Mm -hmm. and here's a parallel. The demonic force in the Bible is the good host in the Quran. The Antichrist of the Bible is the Mahdi of Islam. Second John 2.22. Who is the liar? He who denies that Jesus is the Christ, that God came in the flesh. Mm -hmm. He is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. Major. So what is Allah? Allah is the religion of Antichrist. It is a form of Antichrist. It is a system of Antichrist. And maybe, I know Dave Hunt would, would agree with me on that one. Talking about Sharia Allah, you know, everything Dave Hunt would say about what's happening in the world proves my point. Who's changing the laws? Who's asking to change all the laws throughout the Middle East? Who's establishing Sharia Allah? And what does that law say? Women have no right. Mm -hmm. Does not honor the desire of women and honors a god of forces, a god of fortresses. Who's honoring a god hungry of war and jihad? Who's doing that these days? Is that not a religion of Antichrist? Oh, mm -hmm. my, my, yes it You're is. You're making some good points, brother. <laughs> but, sure are good But points. we still disagree. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's because you're from the old school, you gotta come to the new school. Okay. <laughs> All right, well listen, turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 17. This is going to be an interesting day today, a little different probably than, than, uh, than, what, than what you're used to. I mean, it's just a little bit different. So um, we're going to talk about the origins of Islam. We're going to talk about Rome uh, and the origins of Islam. And you say, why do we need to cover that? Well, there's 2 billion Muslims in the world today that are deceived. They are deceived. They are dead in trespasses and sins. They are people for whom Christ was sent for. Amen? And uh, the Bible says Christ died for the ungodly. He died for the sinner. Amen? And they're sinners. Um, and they need Jesus Christ to save them. But they need the truth. They need to understand that they've been duped. They need to understand that Islam is mystery religion repackaged. That's all it is. And I'm going to prove that to you today. In three sessions, I'm going to prove to you that it's nothing but Roman Catholicism. It's nothing but the mystery of iniquity that doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. It's the same thing. It's the same mystery. It's just a little bit of, of, of creative packaging. All right? It's really not that creative, to be honest with you. It's rather lame. But uh, 
but to people that have been steeped into that, uh, they, they don't see that. Now, listen, I don't hate Muslim people. On the contrary, um, I want them to be saved, just like Roman Catholics. When I tell you, when I, when I preach against Roman Catholicism and I preach against the papacy, I'm not preaching against the Roman Catholic people. Do you understand? They are dead in trespasses and sins. They are fooled. I, I don't hate them. I'm not mad at them, okay? I, I don't wish any ill towards them. I want them to be saved. I want them to come to the knowledge of the truth that they might be saved. That's what's different about it. You, you have a world today that is, listen, you are being, today you are, the fires are being stoked to eradicate Muslims. That's really what's going on. You, you don't see that unless you understand the plan. If you get what the plan is, and, and, um, uh, what's his face? Uh, Albert Pike. He wrote about that in World War III. He said what, what he said would happen. Brother, Brother Anthony, you read that, didn't you? How he, how he said, he said that they would come together and they would, they would eradicate the Muslims and the Jews would just kind of kill off each other. They would get in this huge battle and, uh, and everything like that. And that's what would happen. That's what they want to happen. See, they want a war to wipe out Muslims and they want white Americans to hate Muslims. That's what they want. Because they, 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 they want this confederacy to come together and a certain group of Muslims to be completely wiped out. But you only will understand that once you get these three pieces of the puzzle that I give you today, okay? That's why I'm going to give you one today, one this morning, one in the next hour, and one this afternoon. By the time you get all three of those together, and you say, well, I don't believe, you might come at, when I, when I teach this one to you right here, you may say, I don't believe that. Okay? Well, just hold it in your mind and let's move on to the next sort of evidence, okay? And you might say, well, I don't believe that. Okay, well, then just hold that in your mind, too, and, and contemplate some of those things. And then move on to number three. And then put all three of them together and then weigh the evidence and say, hmm, I think we have a makings of a conspiracy here. It, it appears to me that there is a desire from the devil to trap two billion people and send them straight to hell. See, it's bigger than waving an American flag. It's bigger than patriotism. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's only, I want you to understand something. I'll make it very clear. There's only two religions in the world. There is the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness. Christ come in the flesh, the Savior, God Almighty. Or... There is number two, there is the devil that is to come and his antichrist, which we're going to talk about a little bit. I, I might have to preach another message to you directly on the 12th imam because I, I, I have some pushback when I put that on. I put, I put something on my Facebook page. I said, you know, the 12th imam is really the antichrist. And he is, and I'm going to prove it to you. All of the things that they espouse, they, 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 all the attributes of the twelfth Imam are that of the Antichrist. It's amazing when you listen to their writings and who they're describing. They're describing the Antichrist. That's who they're. That's who they're talking about. Just like when other cults. See, Islam is the second biggest mystery religion on the planet. Second biggest. Second only to Rome, its mother. That's it. Rome is the first, Islam is the second mystery religion. And it, whole, it wields billions of people. And it's powerful. It's a powerful deception. All right, let's get into it. Revelation chapter 17. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee, unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Verse number 5 says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. See, Rome is that great whore. The spirit, let me, let me start by saying this, and I'll probably reiterate this to another message here too today, but the spirit of Babylon rested in Rome. The spirit of the mystery religions rested in Rome. You have to understand that. That's where Mystery Babylon was around before Rome. Okay, I've had somebody say it to me the other day. Well, you don't know what you're talking about because Babylon, mystery Babylon's been around before Roman Catholicism. Well, sure it has. I never denied that. Go all the way back to the Tower of Babel. There it is. World domination. See, stop looking for names and look at their attributes. 
Look at what they produce. Look at the fruit that they have. You're looking at names. I'm going to show you the origins of Islam today. And when I show you this, stop looking just for names. Well, they didn't call it Islam back then. They didn't have to call it Islam. They're describing. It's like the 12th Imam. I said, they're describing. Well, show me in the Bible where the 12th Imam is the Antichrist. That has to be the dumbest statement I've ever heard. First of all, the 12th Imam listed is not in the King James Bible, okay? I don't have to show you that. I can show you the, who they describe as in the Bible, and that's the Antichrist. People, it's not that difficult. I really get sick and tired of people trying to throw out things to stump you and to stall you and to get off the truth. And really what it is is to build up a hate for a group of people. That's what it's about. Build up a hate for a group of people that's been, that's been fomented, and we fell for it in America. Think about this. After 9-11 hit, churches all over America rallying to go destroy Muslims. Think about God Almighty in heaven looking down upon that and seeing his church, seeing his churches, his people called by his name, wanting to eradicate a certain sect of people. Sad, isn't it? All right, well, the first testimony I want to give you today, I'm going to give you a testimony from a Jesuit, a former Jesuit priest. I'm going to give you his testimony. Alberto Rivera, or is it, Riv yeah, Riv Rivera, right? Am I saying that right, Brother brother Aaron? Is it Riviera, or is it Rivera? Rivera? Okay, I just, I don't know. If I mutilate his name, you know who he is. But uh, anyway, he won't mind. He's in heaven now, so he's fine with it, amen? But I want to give you his testimony first. Alberto was a Jesuit priest. He was a high-level Jesuit priest inside the Vatican, and he was trained by a very high-level Jesuit priest named Augustin Bia. This man was a, a very, a very high-level priest. Uh, he was a German Jesuit priest. Uh, this uh, Cardinal Bia was a German Jesuit priest and scholar at the Pontifical Gregorian University, specializing in biblical studies and biblical archaeology. He also served as the personal confessor of Pope Pius XII. He wasn't, a, he wasn't a nobody, okay? He was an insider. And, and he, this is his testimony. I'll read much of it to you. Then I want to show you some external evidences where you can see Mystery Babylon there. He says this, What I'm going to tell you is what I learned in secret briefings in the Vatican when I was a Jesuit priest under oath and induction. A Jesuit cardinal named Augustin Bia showed us how desperately the Roman Catholics wanted Jerusalem at the end of the 3rd century. Because of its religious history and its strategic location, the holy city was considered a priceless treasure. It's very true. I'm going to show you evidences of that in the next hour. Augustine Bia was, the, was the, the, uh, the man that taught him this. In 1959, Pope John the 13th, excuse me, Pope John the 23rd, made him a cardinal at the Catholic Church. He served as the first president of the Sectariat for promoting Christian unity. Oh, how about that? Christian unity. From 1960 until his death, Bia was a leading biblical scholar and ecumenist who greatly influenced relationships with other Christians and Jews during the Second Vatican Council. Oh, how about that? Bia published several books, mostly in Latin, and 430 articles. Anyway, a scheme had to be developed to make Jerusalem a Roman Catholic city. They've, by the way, the popes always wanted to do that. He's always wanted a temple there where he could sit on that temple and say he is God. He has always wanted to sit there and say he is God. On that, Remember, what, what does he call himself? He's the vicar of God. He calls himself the vicar of Christ. He is God on earth. So the Bible talk, what, is it, what does the Bible talk about? It talks about a man will sit on the temple of God saying, in the temple of God saying he is God. Now, some liken that to a final pope that will come to be Antichrist. I'm not going to disagree with that. I can't disprove it, and I can't prove it at this point. I will say it's fascinating, though, that there's a man in every generation that lives and stands up and says he's God. That's right. The poor Arabs fell victim to one of the most clever plans ever devised by the power of darkness. They would use the great untapped source of manpower that could do this job, and that was the children of Ishmael. 
Early Christians went everywhere with the gospel, setting up small churches, but they met with heavy opposition. Both the Jews and the Roman government persecuted believers in Christ to stop their spread. But the Jews rebelled against Rome, and in AD 70 AD, Roman armies under General Titus smashed Jerusalem and destroyed the great Jewish temple from which the heart of Jewish worship in fulfillment of Christ's prophecy in Matthew chapter 24, verse number 2. Remember that? He said they would come and they would be destroyed the temple. Jesus said that. They'll ride in. They're going to destroy the temple. On this holy place where the temple once stood, the Dome of the Rock Mosque stands today as Islam's second most holy place. Coincidental? Uh-uh. Happened on purpose. Just not the way the Pope intended it to happen. See, he intended that he was going to be the one to build that temple there. They would build it for him, and he would sit there on that temple saying he is God. But something happens when you give a couple million crazy people a lot of money, finances. You know what they do? They run around with Toyota trucks and Nike shoes and shoot people and behead people because you fund them to do it. Oh. And they might even be called ISIS. And how rich is that? Who's ISIS? Horus. Funny. Hot name to use. Not really. Makes a lot of sense. It's going to push a world war to eradicate a group of people for a handful of people that we've funded and given money to. Anyway, that's all free. It's not in, it's not in, uh, in the, Jesuit, uh, the former Jesuit priest's notes here, but I thought I'd add that in for clarity. Amen? All right, good. Make sure you're paying attention. Sweeping changes were in the wind. Corruption, apathy, greed, cruelty, perversion, and rebellion were eating at the Roman Empire. It was ready to collapse. The persecution against Christians was useless as they continued to lay down their lives for the gospel of Christ. The only way Satan could stop this thrust was to create a counterfeit Christian religion to destroy the work of God. The solution was in Rome. Their religion had come from ancient Babylon, and all it needed was a facelift. This didn't happen overnight, but began in the writings of the early Christian fathers. Early church fathers, excuse me. It was through their writings that, what a new, that a new religion would take shape. The statue of Jupiter in Rome was eventually called St. Peter. How about that? And the statue of Venus was changed to the Virgin Mary. The site chosen for its headquarters was on the seven hills of, called Vaticanus, the place of a diving serpent where the satanic temple of Janus stood. Well, that wasn't in the history books. Nobody talked about that, did they? Remember what Jesus said? I know where Satan's seat is. Remember that? He said, I know where Satan's seat is. I know where he sits. The great counterfeit religion was Roman Catholicism called Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. She was raised up to block the gospel, slaughter the believers in Christ, establish religions, create wars, and make the nations drunk with the wine of her fornication. As we will see. Three major religions have one thing in common. Each has a holy place where they look for guidance. Roman Catholicism looked to the Vatican and the Holy City. The Jews looked to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, and the Muslims looked to Mecca as their holy city. We don't seek a city here. That's right. Each group believes that they receive certain types of blessings for the rest of their lives for visiting their holy place. In the beginning, Arab visitors would bring gifts to the house of God, and the keepers of the Kaaba were gracious to all who came. Some brought their idols, and not wanting to offend these people, their idols were placed inside the sanctuary. It is said that the Jews looked upon the Kaaba as an outlying tabernacle of the Lord with veneration until it became polluted with idols. In a tribal contention over a well, Zamzam, that's what the well was called, the treasure of the Kaaba and the offerings that pilgrims had given were dumped down the well, and it was filled with sand. It disappeared. Many years later, Al-Mutalib, I hope I'm saying his name right, but I don't know. It's really difficult. Was given visions telling him where to find the well and its treasure. He became the hero of Mecca, and he was destined to become the grandfather of Muhammad. Before this time, Augustine. How about that, Augustine? How about that guy? Remember him, Augustine, that heretic? Became the bishop of North Africa and was effective in winning Arabs to Roman Catholicism, including whole tribes. 
It was among these Arab converts to Catholicism that the concept of looking for an Arab prophet developed. Muhammad's father died from illness and his sons born to great Arab families in places like Mecca were sent into the desert to be suckled and weaned and spend some of their childhood with Budoyan tribes for training and to avoid the plagues in the city. After his mother and grandfather also died, Muhammad was with his uncle when a Roman Catholic monk learned of his identity and said, now listen, here's how it started. Take your brother's son back to his country and guard him against the Jews. For by God, if they see him and know of him that which I know, they will construe evil against him. Great things are in store for this brother's son of yours. So he's setting it up. They're stoking it. The Roman Catholic monk had fanned the flames for future Jewish persecution at the hands of the followers of Muhammad. The Vatican desperately wanted Jerusalem because of its religious significance, but was blocked by the Jews. Another problem was the true Christians in North Africa who preached the gospel. Roman Catholicism was growing in power, but would not tolerate opposition. We know that from history of the Baptists, that they slaughtered the North African Christians over there. They completely slaughtered them. Somehow the Vatican had to create a weapon to eliminate both the Jews and the true Christian believers who refused to accept Roman Catholicism. Looking to North Africa, they saw the multitudes of Arabs as a source of manpower to do their dirty work. Some Arabs had become Roman Catholic and could be used in reporting information to leaders in Rome. Others were used in an underground spy network to carry out Rome's master plan to control the great multitudes of Arab people who rejected Catholicism. When St. Augustine appeared on the scene, he knew what was going on. His monastery served as bases to seek out and destroy biblical manuscripts owned by true Christians. We know that to be true, don't we? From the history of the King James Bible, we understand those manuscripts and everything, that they sought out and they had to destroy those things. In the Vatican briefing, oh, wait, let me back up here, sorry. The Vatican wanted to create a Messiah for the Arab people, someone they would raise up as a great leader, a man with charisma whom they could train and eventually unite all non-Catholic Arabians behind him, create a mighty army that would ultimately capture Jerusalem for the Pope. In the Vatican briefing, Cardinal Bia told us this story. A wealthy Arabian lady who was a faithful follower of the Pope played a tremendous part in this drama. She was a widow named Khadijah. She gave her wealth to the church and retired to a convent but was given an assignment. She was, a, she was very wealthy and she was taken to the... She gave up all of her fortune, gave it to Rome, and they sent her to a monastery. And she uh, joined and became a nun there. She was to find a brilliant young man who could be used by the Vatican to create a new religion and become the Messiah for the children of Ishmael. Khadijah had a cousin named Waruk, who was also a very faithful Roman Catholic, and the Vatican placed him in a critical role as Muhammad's advisor. He had tremendous influence on Muhammad. Teachers were sent to young Muhammad, and he had in intensive training. Muhammad studied the works of St. Augustine, which prepared him for his great calling. The Vatican and Catholic... Arabian people across North Africa spread the story of a great one who was about to rise up among the people and be the chosen one of their God. While Muhammad was being prepared, he was told that his enemies were the Jews and that the only true Christians were Roman Catholic. He was taught that the others calling themselves Christians were actually wicked imposters and should be destroyed. Many Muslims believe this. Muhammad began receiving divine revelations as his wife's Catholic cousin, Waruk, helped to interpret them. From this came the Quran. In the fifth year of Muhammad's mission, persecution came against his followers because they refused to worship the idols in the Kaaba. The Quran, Muhammad did not write the Quran. Jesuit priests wrote the Quran. Muhammad didn't write that. Muhammad instructed some of them to flee Abysnia, where Nigas, the Roman Catholic king, accepted them because of Muhammad's views on the Virgin Mary were so close to Roman Catholic doctrine. These Muslims received protection from Catholic kings because of Muhammad's revelations. Now listen, okay, I want you to understand something here. This is how this works. Muhammad left Mecca, and when he left Mecca, he went to this Catholic king. Now, why would a, a Roman Catholic king take in somebody who had a different religion like that unless he was confederate with it and they were working together for a cause. 
So you have to understand the Pope and his people had confessors that what these kings would confess to and that they would, they would control. This king was a Roman Catholic king, and he supported Muhammad, and he protected Muhammad, and he kept Muhammad for a time and protected him so he could go and he could war and he could do what he was getting ready to do. Muhammad later conquered Mecca and the Kaaba was cleared of idols. The Pope raised up his armies and called them crusades to hold back the children of Ishmael from grabbing Catholic Europe. See, what happened was <laughs> they, they got out of hand and they couldn't control them anymore. So then they had millions and millions and millions of Arabian people out there running around following this guy named Muhammad and and his religion, and they were starting, I mean, they, they just took over. So the Pope raised up and, 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 and got the Catholic Crusades going. The Crusades lasted for centuries, and Jerusalem slipped out of the Pope's hands. Turkey fell, and Spain and Portugal were invaded by Islamic forces. In Portugal, they called a mountain called Fatima in honor of Muhammad's daughter, never dreaming it would become world famous. Years later, when Muslim armies were poised on the islands of Sardinia and Corsica to invade Italy, there was a serious problem. The Islamic generals realized they were far too extended. It was at this time they had peace talks, one of the negotiators was Francis of Assisi. Assisi. I don't want to say that guy's name. Is, it, is he a, the, the, the Assisi guy? Francis of Assisi, that guy. Right? That guy. Anyway, he was, I always say, I don't want to say his name. It just, it just reminds me of Assisi. Anyway, so that, that's, that's what he did. He negotiated with them. Why? Well, first of all, they knew they weren't going to take the Pope. They weren't going to take it, Rome. They weren't going to do that. And they were far too extended, and they knew they had to back up. And then they had to make some negotiations. So I'm going to tell you in another message the negotiations that they made because they're very fascinating. But, uh, and you'll get an understanding of what went on. As a result, Muslims were allowed to occupy Turkey in a Christian world, and Catholics were allowed to occupy Lebanon in the Arabian world. It was also agreed that the Muslims could build mosques, listen, in Catholic countries without interference, as long as Roman Catholics could flourish in Arab countries. That's usually not a problem, still today. Cardinal Bia told us in Vatican briefings that both the Muslims and Roman Catholics agreed to block and destroy the efforts of their common enemy, Bible-believing Christian missionaries. One, one identifying mark of Mystery Babylon will always be their hate for true Bible believers. That will be, they, they will always hate true Bible-believing Christians. They will always murder true Bible-believing Christians. What does the Bible say about that? It says she was drunk with the blood of the saints. That's an, that's an identifying uh, of, of Rome and her daughters, or Mystery Babylon and her daughters. The one thing you will see is an identifying mark of, of all of those is the fact that they desire the blood of the saints. All through history you can see it. Through these concordants, Satan blocked the children of Ishmael from a knowledge of Scripture and the truth. The Islamic community looks on Bible-believing missionaries as a devil who brings poison to the children of Allah. This explains years of ministry in those countries with little results. The Vatican also engineers a campaign of hatred between the Muslim Arabs and the Jews. Before this, they had coexisted peacefully. A light control was kept on Muslims from the Ayatollah down through the Islamic priests, nuns, and monks. By the way, I'm going to show you that these people are high-level Masons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, all these 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 uh, big big. I'm going to show you pictures of them. these these Muslims. But they're masons. Oh yeah, they're shriners and they're masons and they're all working together. They have the same symbols, the same signs. They're in the same mystery religion. It's just repackaged to fit somebody else. The next plan was to. Uh, the next plan was to control Islam. In 1910, Portugal was going socialistic. Red flags were appearing in the Catholic Church, was facing a major problem. Increasing numbers were against the church. The Jesuits wanted Russia involved, and the location of the vision at Fatima could play a key part in pulling Islam to the mother church. In 1917, the Virgin appeared in Fatima. Well, how about that? I find it fascinating, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but that Muhammad worshipped in a cave and got visions in a cave, and so did the Pope. Interesting. Hanging out in caves. The mother of God was a smashing success playing to overflow crowds. As a result, the socialists of Portugal suffered a major defeat. Did you know that um, Mussolini was called the, the protector of Islam? Do you know that? There's a picture of him you can see, and he's on a, on a horse, and he's got a sword in his hand, and he's called the defender or protector of Islam. 
Hmm. Odd, isn't it? Not really. Not when you understand what's really going on. It's not odd at all. It makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense when you bring it back to two things. They're either mystery Babylon or godliness. It's either the spirit of disobedience or the spirit of Christ. There's no other. There's only two in the world. That's it. Sim it's simplified. There's only two. Roman, Catholic, Roman Catholics worldwide began praying for the conversion of Russia, and the Je Jesuits invented the Novenus to Fatima, which they could perform throughout North Africa, spreading good public relations to the Muslim world. Yeah, I don't have time to get down the road of the Jesuits right now, but I've been doing a lot of studying on them. And, w and I, when I bring you that series, it's going to bring a lot of things into perspective. But this is kind of a little piece that fit in the... Uh, before the, to kind of segue into that. The, the, the Arabians thought they were honoring the daughter of Muhammad, which is what the Jesuits wanted them to believe. They, Fatima, was, that was the daughter of Muhammad. They thought that's who they were honoring. It was a name. No, they were... They, 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 but also, the, the Muslims believe in the Immaculate Conception. And I'm going to cover that the next hour. I'm going, to cover, I'm going to preach a message you call the Immaculate Conception Deception. And I want you to, and, and then you will understand that, that Islam believes the same thing as Rome does. Same exact thing. Uh, the Arabs thought they were honoring the daughter of Muhammad. As a result of the vision of Fatima, Pope Pius XII ordered his Nazi army to crush Russia and the Orthodox religion and make Russia Roman Catholic. A few years after he lost World War II, Pope Pius XII started startled the world with his phony dancing sun vision to keep Fatima in the news. It was a great religious showbiz, and the world swallowed it. Like they see Jesus in a bowl of spaghetti or something. Oh, it's just weird. One one person had like a, one guy in New York had like a bowl of oatmeal or something. Said, "There's Jesus." I'm like, no, that's not Jesus. Jesus is not in your oatmeal, okay? You pantheistic weirdo. All right. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But he's he's it's not in your oatmeal. And I hate to break it to you, Pope. He's not in your little little cookie either. Okay. He's not in that little. We're gonna talk about that little cookie God today. We're gonna talk about that. Because that sun fits exactly in the crescent moon, but we're gonna—I'm gonna show you that today. As a result, a group of followers has gone had had grown into Blue Army worldwide, holding millions of faithful Roman Catholics ready to die for the Blessed Virgin. But we haven't seen anything yet. The Jesuits have their Virgin Mary scheduled to appear four or five times in China, Russia, and major appearances in the U.S. What has this got to do with Islam? Well, note Bishop Sheen. Remember Bill, Bishop Fulton Sheen? Do you know who he is? Bishop Fulton Sheen was the handler, the Jesuit handler of Billy Graham. And for him and old Billy traveled on trains together, and they were just the best of friends. His little Jesuit handler that brought all the fame and fortune to him. And he was the go-between from him and Rome. That was, that was the, the go-between. Anyway, um, so Bishop Fulton Sheen's statement is this. Our Lady's appearance at Fatima marked the turning point in the history of the world's 350 million Muslims. After the death of his daughter, Mohammed wrote that she is the most holy of all women in paradise next to Mary. After the death of his daughter. Oh, after the death of his daughter. Okay. I thought it said after the death of Muhammad. I was like, that's kind of weird. Anyway, he believed that the Virgin Mary chose to be known as Our Lady of Fatima as a sign and a pledge that Muslims who believe in Christ's virgin birth will come to believe in his divinity. Bishop Sheen pointed out that the pilgrim virgin statues of Our Lady Fatima were enthusiastically received by Muslims in Africa, India, and elsewhere, that many Muslims are now coming into the Roman Catholic Church. History proves that before Islam came into existence, the Sabians in Arabia worshipped the moon god who was married to the sun god. Wasn't that interesting? You have the sun, and you have Islam as the moon. Crescent. Fits perfect in their communion. When they do their when they do their table of devils, that's what they're doing. They're they're really perverted people, actually. History proves it before that anyway. So uh, let's see here. They gave birth to three goddesses who were worshipped through the Arab world as daughters of Allah. An idol excavated at Hazar in Palestine in the nineteen fifties shows Allah sitting on a throne with the crescent moon on his chest. We're going to talk about that crescent moon here. Muhammad claimed he had a vision from Allah and was told, you are the messenger of Allah. 
This began his career as a prophet, and he received many messages. By the time Muhammad died, the religion of Islam was exploding. The nomadic Arabian tribes were joining forces in the name of Allah and his prophet Muhammad. Some of Muhammad's writings were placed in the Quran, others were never published. They are now in the hands of high-ranking holy men ayatollahs in the Islamic faith. When Cardinal Bia shared this information with us in the Vatican, he said, These writings are guarded because they contain information that links the Vatican to the creation of Islam. Both sides have so much information on each other that if it expo if it, they were exposed, it could create such a scandal that it would be a disaster for both religions. In their holy book, the Quran, Christ is regarded as an only a prophet. Yeah, Allah had no son. That's what they say. In their, in, that's in their holy book. If the Pope was his representative on earth, then he also must be a prophet of God. This caused the followers of Muhammad to fear and respect the Pope as, in, as another holy man. The Pope moved quickly and issued bulls, granting the Arabian generals permission to invade the, and conquer nations of North Africa. The Vatican helped to finance the building of these massive Islamic armies in exchange for three favors. Just three. Number one, eliminate the Jews and Christians. The latter were regarded as true believers, which they called infidels. Number two, protect the Augustinian monks and Roman Catholics. Makes sense. Number three, conquer Jerusalem for his holiness in the Vatican. Well, that one didn't quite go over so well. <laughs> that one didn't. That one didn't. Didn't. Go, and I believe the Lord allowed that to happen. See, I don't. I don't. I think God stopped that. I think the Lord stopped that from happening. I believe that. As time went by, the power of Islam became tremendous. Jews and true Christians were slaughtered, and Jerusalem fell into their hands. Roman Catholics were never attacked, nor were there shrines during this time. But when the Pope asked for Jerusalem, he was surprised at their denial. The Arabian generals had such military success that they could not be intimidated by the Pope. Nothing could stand by the way of their own plan. Under Warrock's direction, Muhammad wrote that Abraham offered Ishmael as a sacrifice. The Bible says that Isaac was a sacrifice, but Muhammad removed Isaac's name and inserted Ishmael's name. As a result of this, the Muhammad and Muhammad vision, the faithful Muslims built a mosque, the Dome of the Rock, in Ishmael's honor on the site of the Jewish temple that was destroyed in 70 AD. This made Jerusalem the second most holy place in the Islamic faith. How could they have give such a sacred shrine to the Pope without causing a revolt? The Pope realized that they had created what, what he had created was out of control when he heard they were calling his holiness an infidel. He didn't like that. <laughs> Got a little mad about that. If he ever met me, I'd call him a lot more. The Muslim generals were determined to conquer the world for Allah, and now they turn toward Europe. Islamic ambassadors approached the Pope and asked for papal bulls to give them permission to invade European countries. The Vatican was outraged. War was inevitable. Temporal power and control of the world was considered the basic right of the Pope. He wouldn't think of sharing it with those whom he considered heathens. So that's the end of, uh, of the Jesuit, I mean the Jesuit, the former Jesuit, Alberto Rivera, his testimony as to what he was told by a very high-level Jesuit priest in the Vatican, okay, and uh, Cardinal Bia and, and his, I mean, Cardinal Bia is a very high-level Jesuit, or was a very high-level Jesuit. You can see it, I mean, in his, his um, doctorates and everything that he had there and his, his, his training and everything. I mean, he, was, he knew what he was talking about. And he was specialized in biblical archaeology, okay, so the guy knew what was going on. See, one thing you have to understand, the Vatican holds all the secrets. They are, that's where the secrets of the arcane rest right there. This, all the secrets of the mystery religions all rest there. They know it all. And I'm going to preach a sermon to you sometime in the future because I think we, we don't understand things. See, we have an open Bible, right? So we have all the truth here. We don't hide anything, right? God doesn't hide the truth from us here. He gives it to us and he reveals it all to us. But the devil's kingdom is the opposite of that. The devil's kingdom is compartmentalized. So if you're a Jesuit, you know what you're told in that compartment. If you're, if you're a witch, you know what you're told in that mystery religion. You know what you are told there, and that's all that – and you know everything. And you're not lying at most of what you're saying. If you come out of it and you get saved and they tell you what happened, they're not lying to you. That's what they know from the compartment that they've been locked in. The Masonic order, they're not lying to you. For the most part, those that come out and are saved and get born again, that, that's the compartment that they're in. It's all they've been told. But what sits high on top, that mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, he, they know all the secrets. The black pope understands all of it. He knows all of it too well. 
So he's not confusing it. Now, now I want to give you some external evidence here. All right. We're making good time here. I'll keep you here till four or five. We'll be set. All right. Um, some external evidence. I'm just kidding. I know it's your first day here. She's like, I mean, really? We don't get to move for like four hours? I didn't sign up for this. Um, external evidence. The crescent moon of Islam in Rome. I want you to listen to this here. It is obvious that this symbol did not originate with Islam. The symbol of the crescent moon and star is extremely ancient and was present in every ancient pagan culture of the world. It is very powerful and important al alchemy, an alchemy symbol uh, relating to the third eye and the sixth chakra as well as to the feminine aspect of the soul. Islam stole this and used it as a primary symbol. Along with the symbol, Islam also stole the ancient pagan lunar calendar of the area. This works directly with the feminine alchemical energies which are manipulated to keep the ignorant followers and slaves. See, they follow alchemy. Alchemy, what's witchcraft? I mean, sorcery. It's more, more, more specifically, it's sorcery. Alchemy's goal is to create the man, the final, the, 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 well, they're going to turn a golem into a man is what they're going to do, and they're going to breathe into it life. And I, I think what they're really showing you is how they, they're, they're trying to get to is the Antichrist. They're trying to show you the rise of the Antichrist through alchemy, um, which, you know, I don't have time to go down that road. Anyway, but, um, but, but understand this. I, I want to see, and Brother Aaron's going to work with me here in the future, and I'm actually, I'm going to have some, some, some I'm going to be able to hit a button on this, right, Brother Aaron? We're going to work this out to where I can hit a button on this, and we'll have, a, we'll have one, Brother Paul, we're going to have one of them fancy uh, slide. <laughs> Telling you, we're going big time here, man. We're, we're gonna we're gonna pull this thing down and have and have some pictures up there for you. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna touch the picture and it's gonna go boop. It's gonna be up there and you'll be like, wow. Anyway, isn't that nice, brother Aaron? Man, I'm telling you, I'm looking forward to that. Anyway, but you've seen the crescent moon, but you can see the crescent moon. In, ar in archaeology, you can see it all over the place. It's there. It's it's predates all the way back to Babylon. You can see it in Assyria. You can see it in the in the tablets anywhere. Just Google it. Just just type in the crescent moon and see the symbol. You've got to understand they're giving you hints and clues to who they are by the symbols they use. But that's they don't call themselves Islam though. They didn't call Babylon. They call, they don't have to. They're using the same method of communication. That is a method of communication that is telling you what they stand for. And you can find it. You can find it. Muhammad did not invent Islam. The Vatican, the Vatican borrowed it from paganism, took it back, repackaged it, and sold it to a bunch of people out in the, out, out in the sand. When they, now, another, another thing. When they take the cookie god out of the pope's place, in the, he places it, the pope places that cookie god inside of a crescent moon. So when you know that weird looking thing he has that he holds up that I don't know it's probably some weird scepter or something I don't know what it is he's a weirdo but anyway he's got this cookie thing and he sets he sets the, and he says that this is the host he calls it that's not spooky enough it's the host and he says it's Jesus in there right and he's going to take Jesus and he sets it into the female crescent the male into the female that's all the further I'm going with that but do you understand what are they picturing? They're picturing the same thing, the sons of God and the daughters of men. They're picturing the same thing. It's the same religion. Islam did not invent that crescent moon. That crescent moon came from Rome. They were using it. They got it from Mystery Babylon. They use the same symbol. And Islamic people are so deceived, they try to say, just like Roman Catholics, well, we don't bow down to these things, or we don't follow any images, or we don't. Yes, you do. You follow images. You follow a crescent moon that you got from Rome, and you don't even know it. The sun and the moon, this represents the generative principle. By the way, did you know the God of the Lodge is Allah? And they have the moon and the stars. I'm going to see if I can find a picture of that for you here real quick. But they have the moon and the stars. The God of the Lodge is Islam over there. And, uh, and they, use, they use the same thing. 
they use they use the same thing of as Islam does. Let's just see this here. I'm going to show you this. Now this is a lodge. You see the crescent moon here? You see that? Are you see you see the you see the pyramids? You see the crescent moon? You see who these people are? Okay, look at this. See that? Okay. Now this is a this is a a, a a Mason Lodge, a Shriners Lodge. This is a Freemason Mason Lodge meeting in Cairo in Egypt in 1940 under the portrait of King Farouk the first. He was the king of Egypt from 1936 to 1952. President Abdul Nasser 1954 to 1970. Mohammed Anwar Sadat 1970 to 1981 were also members of this lodge. This is the ancient Egyptian order and Arab noble of the Mystic Shrine. These are these are these are masons, okay. And I'll show you these pictures later if you want to see them. But but these are masons, okay. Wait a minute, Muslims that are shriners. Whoops, Muslims that are shriners. How does that work? I thought there was. I thought they couldn't follow anything, any symbols or signs, brother Paul. I thought they didn't do any of that stuff. I thought that wasn't what they were about. I thought they were. They 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 didn't go for any of that idolatry stuff. Listen, folks, it's the same mystery religion. It's the same thing. It was started by Babylon. It was started by Rome. It's the same thing. That's the God of the Lodge. How about this? The Star of Islam. You ever seen that before? That's another symbol. I thought they didn't have any stars or any. I thought they didn't have any images or anything like that. They didn't do any of that stuff. Here you go. This is this is the eight-pointed star of Islam. It's called the Star of Islam. See that? It's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> it's looking to be like, what is that? All right, that's the that's the Star of Islam. Why eight points? Well, symbols mean something. They do. They, they mean something. You believe that, don't you? As much as you've seen of, of, of things that, that we've studied and talked about, let me tell you what that eight-pointed star is. That eight-pointed star is a pagan symbol that was associated with the great power throughout the ancient world. It was the symbol of the goddess Astaroth. Huh. The symbol of the goddess Astaroth. And also the symbol of Venus. It represents the heart chakra. Something other than 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 um, than pure Islamic Muhammad and Allah wouldn't that be something different? Hmm. Hello. How about this one? I got another one for you. How about the all-seeing eye in Islam? Now, surely that wouldn't be in there, would it? Surely the all-seeing eye would not be in Islam. Well, I'm going to show you a picture. Of the all seeing eye in Islam. Give me a second here, let me find it. 
I know it's here somewhere. Here it is. This right here is the all-seeing eye in Islam. Okay? This is the all... You see it from there? Can you see it? It's called the Hamza, actually. What in the world does that mean? Well, I'm going to show. I'm going to tell you what it means here. That Hamza, I think I'm pronouncing it right anyway. Yeah, I am. Also, Romanized the Hamza meaning five is a palm-shaped amulet popular throughout the Middle East and North Africa, and commonly used in jewelry and wall hangings, depicting the open right hand, an image recognized and used as a sign of protection in many societies throughout history. The Hamza is believed to provide defense against the evil eye. The symbol predates Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In Islam, it is also known as the Hand of Fatima. Remember that name, Fatima? So named to commemorate Muhammad's daughter, Fatima. The Levantine Christians call it the Hand of Mary. They're not really Christians, by the way. For the Virgin Mary, Jews refer to it as the Hand of Miriam, in remembrance of biblical Miriam, sister of Moses. In Islam, the Hamza is called the Hand of Fatima in honor of one of the daughters of the Prophet Muhammad. Some say in an Islamic tradition, the five fingers represent the five pillars of Islam. In Old Turkish, this sign is called... Uh, with pens meaning hand of five, the household of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. This relates the, to the belief that God exists in everything, they say. That's why they have that hand with the all-seeing eye in it. It's five fingers. They have it held up there, and they have the eye in the middle. This relates to the belief that God exists in everything. Another meaning of the symbol relates to the sky god, Horus. Oh. It refers to the eye of Horus, which means man cannot escape from the eye of conscience. It says that the sun and the moon are the eyes of Horus. Hand of Fatima also represents femininity. It is referred to as the woman's holy hand. It is to believe they have extraordinary characteristics that use to protect people from evil and other dangers. Now, why would Islam have the same mystery, Babylon the Great, eye? Why would they have that symbol? The daughter of Muhammad. Why would they have that symbol? You know, the Bible talks about that idle shepherd, though, that guy that's watching. It says in Zechariah 11, 17, Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. It's only got one eye. The left eye. You see... These are, out, these are external signs that Islam is nothing more than a mystery religion. It's nothing more than, than Babylon. It's nothing more than created. Because why would you use these symbols that are not, they're not biblical? I mean, they're not right. They're not godly. Um, why would they use those symbols? And Muhammad had nothing to do with any of those things. Why would they have those? I mean, why, where did Muhammad get those things from? Where did he get that from, the all-seeing eye? Where would Muhammad get that from? Where did he get the crescent moon from? Where did he get those external signs? Signs from why does he believe in the immaculate? Why do why do Muslims believe in the immaculate conception? Why do they believe that? Strange. I'm going to prove to you they do by Muhammad's own words. Father, thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you for your words. Thank you for the truth, Lord. Lord, we just pray that maybe some Muslims will hear this and come out of that and be saved. Maybe some Christians will get educated enough to understand the history of Islam and be able to use that to reach others for Christ. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation chapter 17, verse number 5, And upon her forehead was a name written mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. Revelation 18.2, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. How about that? Hateful. You ever notice that with the lost and those that have... They say that we're the ones that hate. You don't love enough people, but if you ever challenge those people, you see how much hate they have in them. There's just an absolute extreme amount of hate. They tell us that we're mean, but you can tell when somebody's filled with devils and the way they act by how hateful they get towards the truth, by how much they fight the truth and they rail against it and they get angry against it. Well, Babylon is that place. Babylon, obviously we understand the Tower of Babylon. We understand going the Tower of Babel, the gateway of the gods it was called. 
in history. Historically, that was the name that it was given. The Gateway of the Gods is what it was called. And, I mean, a lot of wicked things going on in Babel. Uh, go, go back and listen to that series if you've not heard that. Nimrod, Babylon, Isis, uh, Osiris, or Samaris, and all those. If you go back there and you see what happened and what took place, wasn't pretty. Bad stuff. What was it? Well, Babylon back then, it was the habitation of devils in the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So where is it now? It rests in Rome. That's where it rests today. Some try to say that, well, Jerusalem is Babylon. Not, not the Babylon that's talked about here. It's not. I'm going to tell you why. It's not. First of all, Jerusalem is not on seven hills. It's on five. Israel is not on seven. It's on five. That It's not on seven. The Vatican is on seven. Okay? That's easily proven. The Vatican is on seven. There is a, there, now listen, do I, do I believe, let me clear something up before I get into this. I know we're talking about Muslims, but I want to clear something up here. That the, I, I realize that there are, there are Jews, there are Jesuit Jews that are out there that are in high-level positions and places in this, in this world, and I realize that they are apostate. They say they are Jews, and they are not. They are of the synagogue of Satan. But that's not the Jewish, that's not every person that lives over in Israel. That's not every person that lives in that land or everybody of Jewish descent. They are all lost and need a Savior. They are all lost and dying in their sins. And if they don't turn to Christ and repent of their sins and be born again by the Spirit of God, then they will die and go to a devil's hell. Amen. There's only one way to be saved, and that's through the, through the blood of Jesus Christ. There is no other offer. There is no other sacrifice. There is nothing else that is pleasing to God but the sacrifice of His dear Son. No matter what nationality you're from, no matter where you're from, there's no other name given on heaven. Given under heaven, whereby we must be saved. That's it. Just Jesus Christ. That's all. So, uh, but, however, I do understand that Jesuits are masters of deflection. Okay? And they've masked themselves. They were able to mask themselves in Islam. The Pope was able to mask himself in Islam and sell another version, another another type of Christianity or another type of religion to a bunch of Arabian people. And he was able to do that by masking and covering up some things. So when I say when I say that mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, is Rome, I mean that that spirit of that Babylon rested in Rome. There, were, there was always a place where those secrets of the arcane, those secrets of the occult, those secrets of the mystery religions were kept. There was always that. Babylon was the place of it at first there. That spirit of Babylon is still there. I do believe there's a commercial Babylon that will rise. And I actually am starting to come under the impression that America is the, industri the military-industrial complex of Babylon and fights all her wars. That's, I'm starting to come to that that place of position where I, I believe that it's the military arm. See, we think of it as location only. No, he's talking about the mother. He's talking about a spiritual whore is what he's talking about. Spiritual harlotry. He's talking about devils. He's talking about high-level devils, demons, fallen angels, a, a spirit. He's talking about that Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots. That's what he's talking about. I believe today it rests with that black pope and the Jesuits are in control of it today. We'll talk about them someday, hopefully soon. My head, it, that's, there's just a lot of studying that goes into that. And I, I've put so many hours into it, and I'm not done yet. I mean, I, I've, just, I've just like scratched the surface in starting that study. But I want to talk to you about Rome and Islam, and I want to show you, I want to show you their doctrines are the same. I want to show you the doctrinal similarities. Why are they the same? Because they're both mystery religions. That's why. And one is the mother of the other. That's why. And we know that Islam is not the mother of Rome. But but I'm gonna. I'm. I've, hopefully, I've proved so far, and I will continue to prove that Rome is the mother of Islam. She is the. She is the cage of every unclean. Unclean spirit. All right. Number one. Rome and Islam both believe in the Immaculate Conception. They both believe in the Immaculate Conception. Here's what Muhammad said in his own words. The Satan touches every son of Adam on the day when his mother gives birth to him, with the exception of Mary and her son. Hmm. Now, where would a... <laughs> 
where would a where would a Muslim man out in the middle of Arabia, the Arabian deserts and everything? Where where would he find out in the middle of Mecca and everywhere else, running around, running around? Where would he get the idea that Mary came from an immaculate conception? Where would he get that from? He got it from the writings of Augustine. That's where he got it from. Because he was trained in the writings of Augustine. That's where he learned it from. He was coached in the writings of Augustine. That's where he learned them. There are 34 direct references to Mary in the Quran. Muhammad said that very clearly he believed in an immaculate conception, which, by the way, didn't come to popularity until 300 to 400 years after Christ, which would be in the time of Constantine, which would be the time of the flaming sword. As I'll show you later, Muhammad was taught this doctrine by the writings of Augustine. Uh, thus, Islam believes that only Mary and Jesus were not touched by Satan. Even Muhammad did not have this distinction. Do you understand that? He is saying that even he didn't even give himself that distinction. But he's saying that Jesus and Mary were immaculately conceived, immaculate conception. Why the exaltation of the virgin? Because it's Isis they're exalting. And it's Horus they're exalting. And he learned it from Augustine. He did not learn that from the Bible. He did not learn it from, he didn't learn it. Who told him that? Who taught him that? Who taught a man out in the middle of nowhere that? Rome and Islam both venerate a false Christ and a false Mary. They believe in a perpetual Mary, a perpetual. So it must have came from Rome. So that's evidence number one, Romanism. Romanism and Islam both believe in an immaculate conception. Number two, Rome has a pope. Islam has a caliph or caliph. Shia Muslims believe that Ali, the son of the son-in-law and cousin of Muhammad was chosen by Muhammad as his spiritual and temporal successor as the Mali, the Imam, and the Caliph. Of all Muslims at a place called al Ghadar Qum, where Muhammad called up around 100,000 gathered returning pilgrims to give their oath of allegiance to Ali in his very presence and thenceforth to proclaim the good news of Ali's succession to his leadership to all Muslims they should come across. So, so what do they have here? They have an apostleship. Where'd they get that from? Where there was one man that would be invested with the power and the authority, and he would be the and he would be the 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 prophet over all of them. Where did he get that from? He got it from the Pope. He got that design from Rome, because Rome has one superior leader, and Islam had that. Now that changed later in time, but but that's how they were for a while. That that name uh, Caliph means um, a meaning successor, substitute, or lieutenant. The rise of Islam and the caliphs is said to translate to deputy of God. It is used in the Quran to establish, listen to this, Adam's role as representative of God on earth. Adam is not representative of God on earth. It's right, that is Jesus. So wait, so where did he get the idea of God on earth from then in, in the form of man? Where would he get that from? He got that from the Pope. That's where he got it from. That's where it came from. Khalifa is also used to describe the belief that man's role in his real nature is the Khalifa or viceroy to Allah. See, the vicar. See that? The word is also most commonly used for Islamic leader of Ummah, starting at Abu Bakr and his line of successors. Anyway, the first four caliphs mentions here, I'm not going to go into their names. The Sunni and the Shia differ on succession, but the first caliphs were followed. They followed. If they, if they invested that authority, if Allah said this, or if Muhammad said this is the leader, then this was going to be the successor for all. He was the head of Islam. He was the head of everything. That's how they did it. Number three, Rome teaches a world empire and world domination, and so does Islam. The Pope wants world domination. Where did Jesus Christ tell us to go and conquer the world? He didn't. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He didn't say, take the sword and murder. He didn't say that. Where does this come from? Well, number one, the Pope believes that he should have the temporal power of the world. Do you understand that? I, I, I think you, you think it's like a customary thing when you see full-grown men walk up to some weird-looking spooky dude in a white outfit, in a white robe, with a weird spooky-looking hat on, 
an old dude that doesn't have a wife. It's really creepy because he's never been married. And he comes up and they and they and they take this man's hand and they I'm not gonna do it, brother, I promise. But they but they kiss this they kiss this man's hand. And they bow the knee to him. And they kiss his hand. Oh, creepy, weird, scary dude. Think about it. Do you, you think that's just ceremonial? No, that's not ceremonial. They are accepting world leaders do it. Why do world leaders do it? Why would the President of the United States bow to the Pope and kiss his hand? Because he's accepting the temporal power of the Pope. That's why. Do you know what temporal power means? It means earthly power. It means that I am placing myself underneath his power. That's what that means. Kings come and bow down to him. Presidents come and bow to him and kiss his finger and reverence that dirty, rotten devil. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I supposed to call him a nice guy who says he's God on earth? Is that what you're going to do to the Antichrist? You're going to walk him and kiss his hand and say, you're God on earth? If I was here, and if you were here at that time, I, I, I believe that you would look at him and say, you're a devil. Go ahead and take my head now. Amen. All right. First, the temporal dominion of the Pope is most ancient. Listen to this. This is from the Catholic uh, in, in their writings. The temporal dominion of the Pope is the most ancient in point of time. He commenced, as we have seen, to enjoy full sovereignty about the middle of the 8th century. The Pope was consequently a temporal ruler for upwards of 1,100 years. The papal dynasty is therefore the oldest in Europe and probably the world. The Pope was the temporal ruler of Rome. 400 years before England subjugated Ireland and 700 before the first European pressed his foot on the American continent. The popes during the Middle Ages ruled the world and placed it in utter darkness for nearly a thousand years. They suppressed any Christians, any Bible they found, any manuscripts that were true. They suppressed them, they burned burnt libraries, they destroyed people, they gutted children, they ripped up women, they destroyed, they slaughtered anyone who would not accept their, their rule over them. I want, to, I want you to listen to this quote from 1847, or this one, actually this one's from 1912 in America here. Tell us we are Catholics first and Americans are Englishmen afterwards. Of course we are. Tell us in the conflict between the church and the civil government, we take the side of the church. Of course we do. Why, if the government of the United States were at war with the church, now when he says church, he means Rome. Understand? He means the Pope. He's talking about Rome. He's talking about the papacy. Understand, this is not somebody that's fighting for truth. We would say tomorrow, to hell with the government of the United States. And if the church and all the governments of the world were at war, we would say to hell with all the governments of the world. Why is it that in this country, where we have only 7% of the population, the Catholic Church is so much feared? She is loved by all her children and feared by everybody. Why is it the Pope has so much tremendous power? Why the Pope is the ruler of the world. All the emperors, all the kings, all the princes, all the presidents of the world. I don't think he's talking about Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> Sorry. Listen, listen to what he says. Listen to this. Why, the Pope is the ruler of the world. All the emperors, all the kings, all the princes, all the presidents of the world are as these altar boys of mine. The Pope is the ruler of the world. The Western Watchman, a paper published in St. Louis by Father D.S. Fellin, June 27, 1912. Boy, I wonder, he gave a little bit too much truth there, I think, didn't he? Maybe a little bit too much slip there. Maybe he's a little too bold. How about this one? 1960, let's see, this one is 18, no, this one's 1922. Listen to this one. The hand of God who guides the course of history was set down the chair of his vicar on earth. On this city of Rome, which from being the capital of the wonderful Roman Empire, was made by him the capital of the whole world. Because he made it the seat of sovereignty, which since it extends beyond the confines of the nations and states, embraces within itself all the peoples of the whole world. The very origin and divine nature of this sovereignty demands the inviolable rights of conscience of millions of the faithful of the world demand that this sacred sovereignty must not be, neither must it ever appear to be, subject to any human authority or law whatsoever, even though that law be one which proclaims certain guarantees for the liberty of the Roman pontiff. 
He says he doesn't answer to anybody because he's God on earth. That's what he's telling you. He doesn't answer to any governor. By the way, that was uh, Pope Pius XI. On the peace of Christ and the kingdom of Christ. I think they got their kingdom a little backwards, don't they? I think they got the wrong kingdom they're fighting for, don't you? See, they want the see they want the temporal power of the Pope. They they believe that that is the kingdom that's gonna that's gonna rule the world. That the Pope is. We'll talk about that. That final Christ will come and and do that. Muhammad did the same thing, though. He conquered by a sword. We're gonna talk about that in a second. He conquered by a sword. He did the same thing. What did he want? World domination. You cannot disagree with Islam. What is Sharia law? Same thing. We're gonna talk about Sharia law versus canon law in a few minutes. Same thing. All right, next, number four. Rome forced conversions by the sword, and so does Islam. Forced conversion by the sword. Islam had, had jihad, and Rome has its crusades. How about it? Same thing, no different. Same crusades going on right now. Same thing. Muslims and scholars do not all agree on its definition of what jihad means within the contents of classical Islamic law. It refers to struggle against those who do not believe in the Islamic God Allah and do not acknowledge the submission to Muslims, and so is often translated a holy war. Although this term is controversial, holy war. That's what the wars were, that's what the crusades were, were holy wars. That's when the Pope got kings to go trample the Muslims. Why? Because they were going to take the holy land, and he wanted it for himself. He didn't want it for any Jewish people. He wanted it for himself. He, he didn't care. He wanted those sites because he didn't want Muhammad to sit, or he didn't want a Muslim to sit on that temple and say he was God. That's what the war was about. He wanted to sit on that temple and say he's God. Still does today. According to the Dictionary of Islam and Islamic tradition, historian in the large majority of cases, jihad has a military meaning. Of course it does. So do the Jesuits. The Jesuits are a military order. The Knights of Malta, a military order. They are military. They, are, they push and promote the temporal power of the Pope. That's what their whole goal is. Islamic scholars that the, say that the concept of jihad will always include armed struggle against wrongdoers. It was generally supposed that the order for a general war could only be given by the caliph, an office that was claimed by the Ottoman sultans. But Muslims who did not acknowledge the spiritual authority of the caliphate, which has been vacant since 1923, such as non-Sunnis and non-Ottoman Muslim states, always look to their own rulers for the proclamation of jihad. See, there's a certain class of Muslims that the Pope really wants to wipe out, and it's that class that, doesn't, that, that, that has a leader that's not, that does not bow to him. If they don't bow to him as the supreme religious leader in the world and his temporal power, yes, yeah. If they have a caliphate, they, they, then they're going to fight the pope. They're not going to go. They're not going to because they have a ruler. They have one that they follow, and they and they, they say he is the supreme, and not the pope. And if you say that, then the pope has the pope's going to wipe you out. He's fine if you have all if you accept his temporal authority. He'll let you worship a dog if you want to. He doesn't care. Muslim states always look to their own rulers of proclamation of a jihad. There has been, in fact, no universal warfare by Muslims of non-believers since the early caliphate. I don't know about that. So proclaimed jihad by claiming themselves as Mahdi, the Sudanese Muhammad Ahmed in 1882. Here's what the Quran says. I am with you. Give firmness to the believers. I will instill terror into the hearts of the unbelievers. Smite ye above their necks and smite all their fingertips off them. World dom it's just Dominion theology. They learned it from the Pope. Yeah. Dominion theology, they learned it from the Pope. They, they believe that they can force the conscience of a man. Why do you think they murdered 50 million? Do you think Muslims are great? Do you really think Muslims are the greatest terror known to man right now? No, friend. It's, it's the organization that killed 50 million Baptist people in the world. It's the ones that killed 50 million baptized believers. And then some. It's the ones that it's it's the man and the and the institution that is that is that is sent kings after innocent people to destroy them. It's the one that has a whole military industrial complex today that works for him that goes off and fights wars for him. He is the dangerous one. He's the dangerous one. The Quran goes on to say this, So when the sacred months have passed away, then slay the idolaters wherever you find them, and take them captive and besiege them, and lie in wait for them in every ambush. Then if they repent and keep up prayer and pay the poor rate, 
leave their way free to them. Convert or die. That's what jihad is, convert or die. It's a holy war, convert or die. And where did they learn it from? They learned it from Rome. That's what Rome did. Rome did the same exact thing and still does it in some countries. They can't do it here because there's too many of us and we have guns. That's why. God's mercy. And we have a First Amendment and the Second Amendment. You know what the, the Pope hates more than anything? The First and Second Amendment. Because he don't believe in freedom of speech. Oh, no. Oh, no. See, you're too dangerous to have this Bible, Brother Paul. It's too dangerous for you, for you commoners to have this Bible. Too dangerous for the boy that, that plows the field to have that. Too dangerous for him. John Knox gave his life for that. He's out of a plowboy knowing more about the scriptures than, than a pope or a bishop. The Crusades were military campaigns sanctioned by the Latin Roman Catholic Church during the High Middle Ages and Late Middle Ages. In 1095, Pope Urban II proclaimed the First Crusade with the stated goal of restoring Christian access to holy places in and near Jerusalem. Many historians, historians and some of those involved at the time, like St. Bernard, of, uh, give equal precedence to other papal-sanctioned military campaigns undertaken for a variety of religious, economic, and political reasons such as the Albigensians Crusade and uh, a couple of the other ones, the Northern Crusades. Following the First Crusade, there was an intermittent 200-year struggle for control of the Holy Land, with six more major crusades and numerous minor ones. In 1291, the conflict ended in failure with the fall of the last Christian stronghold in the Holy Land of, at Acre after the Roman Catholic Europe mounted no further coherent response in the East. What they do? They fought the Muslims with a sword. You either convert or you die. You either convert or you die. So what they do? They do the same thing. They believe in dominion. Islam is dominion theology. It believes that the state and the church should all be mingled together. The religious state is all the same thing. They believe in a dominion theology, just like Rome. A dominion, you, can chase, you can trace them by their father. You can trace them by their mother. They all believe in a dominion worldwide control by the sword. All leading up to the end of the beast. When you'll either worship the beast or you will get your head cut off. Amen? You're going to starve. Convert or die. That's it. By the way, here's another interesting point I won't be labor long on. The capital Rome is the Vatican. Islam is the Mecca. They both have a holy city. One has, one has uh, the Vatican that they look towards. One has Mecca that they do that. Why? That's important. Okay? And there's this thing called, and I don't have time to, to elaborate on this, but there's this Kaaba, there's this stone, and they, all, and, and they say they don't believe in idolatry or falling down and worshiping idols, but if you watch, in the, they all walk around this big black stone that fell down from Jupiter. Right, Brother Aaron? It fell down from Jupiter. Anyway... So they walk around this stove and they do this stove, this stone, this stone. They walk around it in a circle. I don't know if you've ever understood. You remember that circle maker? Remember that? That God never told us to walk around something and pray like that. I mean, he never told us to do. They never instructed us to do that. At least not. What's this stone? And why would you walk around this stone? Why would you do that? Why would you? I mean, it's a venerated object. Then where does that come from? Rome. It comes from Rome. That's where it comes from, Mystery Babylon, which is Rome. Same thing. The spirit rested there. All right, next. Rome has canon law. Islam has Sharia law. All right? Canon laws, the body of laws and regulations made by ecclesiastical authority, church leadership for the government of a Christian organization or church and its members. By the way, when they say church, they mean the harlot Rome. So don't take it for what we say when we say church. Understand that, okay? That's not a biblical church. It's their their definition of Rome. Okay, that's, that's what it is. So understand that. For the governor of the Christian organization or church and its members, it is the internal ecclesiastical law governing the Catholic Church, both Latin Church and Eastern Catholic Churches, and Eastern and Oriental Orthodox Churches, and the Anglican Communion of Churches. The way that such church law is legislated, interpreted, and at times adjudicated varies widely among these three bodies of churches. In all three traditions, a canon was originally a rule adopted by a church council. These canons form the foundation of canon law. 
So they are ruled by canon law. Now, canon law is not scripture. You understand that, right? The Bible believer, that's why they have to, that's why they cannot accept sola scripture. They cannot accept that. They cannot accept scripture alone. Why? Because they follow canon law. They follow a law outside of the Bible. What is, what is, now, we're, not, so that's Rome's canon law. Well, where do, Islam has Sharia law. Listen. To the Arabic speaking people, Sharia, means legislation, means the moral code and religious law of a prophetic religion. The term Sharia has been largely identified with Islam in English usage. Sharia deals with many topics addressed by secular law, as well as personal matters such as um, marriage relations, hygiene, diet, prayer, everyday etiquette, and fasting. Adherence to Islamic law has served as one of the distinguishing characteristics of the Muslim faith historically. And through the centuries, Muslims have devoted much scholarly time and effort into its elaboration. Human interpretations of Sharia vary between Islamic sects and respect, respective schools of jurisprudence. Yeah, yet in its strictest and most historical coherent definition, Sharia is considered the infallible law of God. There are two primary sources of Sharia law. The precepts set forth in the Quranic verses and the example set by the Islamic prophet Muhammad in the Sunnah, where it has official status, Sharia is interpreted by Islamic judges with varying responsibilities for the religious leaders, imams. For questions not directly addressed in the primary sources, the application of Sharia is extended through consensus of a religious scholars. Thought to embody, so what is it? Traditions of men. It's all traditions of men. But this is that Sharia law that they follow. This is what they follow. Where do they get this, this law that you must live by? Where do they get that idea from? They get it from Rome. Christians don't have a, a law that a law like that. What is our law? Psalm 19:7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever, and the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold sweeter than also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. That's our law. Our law comes from rock-solid proof of the Scriptures. All right, next. Rome and Islam both call Jerusalem sacred and want to rule it. Why is it that the Pope wants to rule Jerusalem? Why is it that the Muslims want to rule? The, the, the Muslims want Israel. They, want, they put the dome of the rock there. Why, why is that? Why do they want Jerusalem? Jerusalem and Islam, listen to this, refers to the status of Jerusalem in the Muslim religious tradition. The al aqaza whatever that name is, in Jerusalem is built on the site of the second place of worship, built by man after the Masad al-Haram. al aqaza is the third holiest site in Sunni Islam after the mosques of al-Haram in Mecca and in Medina. It is strongly associated with the biblical prophets David, Solomon, Elijah, and Jesus. It was the first direction of prayer in Islam before the Kaaba in Mecca. Before they got their lucky stone in Mecca that they say they don't worship. I, it's funny. No, you want to hear something funny? You, I was reading all these Islamic websites yesterday. I know that's sad, isn't it? But I was, I was reading all these yesterday, and you, you know what they said? We do not worship the Kaaba stone. We do not bow down. We do not worship the Kaaba stone. All these they were saying over and over again. Yet you watch their pilgrimage and they're, and they're all walking around it. They're all venerating it. It's like, yes, you do. No matter how many times you say that, I'm going to keep telling you, you are worshiping that thing. You are counting. It's like, it's like when Christians say this, by the way. And stop. Stop saying this. That you're going to go to Jerusalem to get... I want to go to Israel and get baptized. i got to go to Israel to get baptized. You never heard that? Oh, yeah, Christians taking tours over there, and their pastor's baptizing them over there. Why? Do you see what that... That's not us. We don't have that. We weren't given anything like that. We weren't told to follow anything like that. It's confusion. Yeah. According to the Quran, the Islamic prophet Muhammad was taken by a miraculous steed. His name was Baruch. 
Not Barak, Baruch. I think. He was taken by Baruch, I'm going, I don't, I'm, I'm going to be careful because I don't want to say it wrong, to visit the farthest mosque, which many Muslims believe is the al Aqwaza Mosque in Jerusalem, where he prayed, and then he was taken to heaven in a single night in the year 620. This event is known as the Isra Wall Mirage. It's a mirage, all right, in the Islamic tradition. Um, so basically, he said he, he went, and not on a magic carpet ride, but he went on a magic horsey ride. And he, he took this horsey, and he took his horsey into, into um, Jerusalem. Is it, is it not funny that it just so happened that, the, that, the, that, the, that one of the most holy places has to be Jerusalem? Had to be where that temple was. Had to be where the Jews were. That had to be the most... He had to take a pit stop there. Maybe the horse had to, I don't know, go potty or something. So he had to take a spot right there, and he stopped right there, and he had to stop right there in Jerusalem. He had to stop right there. That had to be a holy place. So now all the Muslims believe it's a holy place, and they've got to take control of it. So we've got to fight over it. Why? Well, because Islam wants Jerusalem, and so does Rome. Because there's a showdown coming there. And whether you're pre-trib, post-trib, whatever trib you are, there's a showdown coming there. Amen. It's coming. And it's coming there. And God ain't finished with that area yet. And there will be a remnant that believe the gospel and are saved over there. There, there will be one of those. It will happen. Okay. According to the Quran, though, that's where, Muslim, that's, where, that's where Muhammad went on his horsey ride. Israel signs a... Oh, listen to this, though. This is interesting. You ready? Israel signs a peace treaty with Jordan, which, according to reports in the Harez newspaper, included secret clauses concerning water in Jerusalem. The agreement had been negotiated in London eight months before between Rabin, King Hussein, and Lord Victor Mishkan. As a part of the agreement, Jordan would receive control of the Islamic holy sites within a Vatican-controlled old city of Jerusalem. Now, speed ahead, well, back for us, but March 1995, a cable from the Israeli embassy in Rome to the foreign ministry was in Jerusalem as leaked to a radio station, Arut Shiva, confirming the handover of Jerusalem to the Vatican. Two days later, the cable made front page of the Haaretz News. In the widely distributed minutes of a meeting with President Clinton in 1997, Perez ended the cable with the words, as I had previously promised the Holy See. See, in 1995, they signed over the, the temporal rights of the Mount to the Pope. It was given to him. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that, but it was. Simon Perez did that. Look it up. You can see it. He signed it over. They had an agreement. That's what all this Camp David and all these camps and all these... How fitting, huh, Camp David? Um, uh, that's what all these things are about. It's about that, they, they, that little piece of land over there. Mm -hmm. All right. So anyway, they both want Israel. Next, Roman Islam teach salvation by works. They teach salvation by works. You can get a man to do anything you want him to do as long as you hold salvation over him. That's why you'll never get me to be a water dog, a Campbellite. you never get me to be one of them Duck Dynasty guys. Hey, did you see that? Is that not sad? I ought to touch on that since I've seen it. Did you see the, the, the ad that I posted uh, on my Facebook page? I, I warned everybody, don't watch the video, because I didn't watch the video either. I clicked on it and said, okay, enough of that, and I clicked off of it real fast. Well, the daughter of the Duck Dynasty boys that are elders in the Church of, of uh, the Church of Christ, the Water Dogs, sent his, sent his daughter, he sent his 17-year-old daughter to Dancing with the Stars. And uh, he sent her, and she's basically, she's basically dressed like a whore, and she's dancing like a whore. By the way, whore is not a bad word. It's a bad thing to be, but it's not a bad word. Amen. It's a Bible word. Amen. Teach your children what the Bible says about being a whore. Right. And maybe they won't grow up to be one. Amen? Amen. Huh? Amen. Why don't you warn them and tell them the truth about it? Don't get scared of God's law. Amen. Preach it. Amen. Tell them the truth of it. Warn them. Anyway, so that girl, she's up there dressing, I mean dancing, 
and they're they're making they're, they're talking about getting dirty and down and dirty. I'm not going to go into details, but anyway, that's what they're that's what they're doing. Okay, and I didn't watch it. My wife was sitting right next to me, <laughs> so you know she knows I'm not going to watch that stuff without her being around. And then if something comes up, I just shut it off. But anyway, the point is, is that that's what they were doing. And I got a lot of flack from people when I preached that message, the dangers of Duck Dynasty. I mean, I had hate mail like you and believe. How could you say that about Uncle Sid or whatever his name is? Is that his name? I don't know what his name is. <laughs> what is his name? Uncle Cy. How could you say that? Phil's a godly man. Phil's a godly man. I mean, he's got a cool beard. I'll give you that. I'm jealous of the beard. I mean, do you know what the number one comment that was made? I know this is a rabbit trail. I'll try to hurry. You, you know what the number one comment that was made? Well, you only have five people in your church. There's only five people listening. What is that, your family? No, it's Paul's family. He's listening. His family's here. Everybody else ditch me. But Paul's here. Those are the five people you see, okay? And there were actually like 10 people there that day, I think. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how many was here. <laughs> it, it looked bad, though, because all you could see is like two empty chairs in the front. You can see like, you can see like, you can see like two people in the back, and they're like, no wonder why. Everybody hates him. Look how he preaches. Nobody's even showing up. <laughs> like, that's never stopped me before. It was funny though. You couldn't imagine the hate mail over over that. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. Still comes in too. You're just jealous of them. You're just jealous. That's what it is. You're jealous. Yeah, you can tell that's what it is. You got me. I'm jealous. You caught me. That's what it is. I'm jealous. Okay. Oh, uh, anyway. But I brought that up to say this, that if I held salvation by baptism, if I held that in my hands, then I could control whether you could be saved or not. God never gave any man control over your salvation. That is a decision between Christ and you. That is repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That is a moving and a working of the Holy Ghost of God Amen. under conviction by the Lord. That is not a work of me. I can't baptize you and save you like that. That is absolutely impossible. And God would never leave it under my control to do that for you. He would never leave it up to a man. Otherwise, Rome would be right if it was left. But that's the great sin of baptismal regeneration. The badge of the whore. So where do we see it at? We see it here in Islam. We see work salvation. We see a work salvation here. What do we see here? Number one, there are five pillars of Islam. Number one, say the confession of faith. Hey, that sounds like fundamental. Never mind. Um, a Muslim must confess God but Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet of God. Number two, they must pray. Muslims are supposed to pray five times a day. Shortly before sunrise, mid-morning, noon, mid-afternoon, and after sunset. What happens if you forget once? You're going to hell. Number three, give alms. I like that one. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> give alms. Muslims are to give about 2.5% of their wealth. How'd they figure 2.5%? Where'd that figure come from? I'm just curious. They're supposed to give 2.5% of their wealth. Who broke it down like that? I mean, really? Like it, like when Muhammad was getting... No, it was Joseph Smith that got the golden plates, right? Yeah, when Muhammad was getting his vision, he just said, now I want you to have them give 2.5%. Okay. Number, let's see, number four, fast during Ramadan. F for one lunar month, for one loony month, from sunrise to sunset, Muslims are not to allow anything to pass down their throat. What about spit? Oh, wait, never mind. It's covered. Theoretically, a good Muslim would even spit out his or her saliva. Weird. Then from sunset to sunrise, they are permitted to eat as little or as much as they want. That's weird. 
This is their way of developing discipline and relating to the poor. Travelers, young children, and pregnant or nursing mothers do not need to keep the fast. So it says that somewhere. <laughs> With the exception of this. Number five, they must make a pilgrimage to Mecca. Every Muslim who is financially able is supposed to travel to the birthplace of Islam once in his, in his or her lifetime. That wouldn't be Mecca, that'd be Babylon. But they don't know that. By the way, Muslims have no yeah, Muslims have no guarantee of being saved. They believe that all their works will be accounted for and that on the judgment day, if your bad works outweigh your good works, you're going to go to hell. But if your good works outweigh your bad works, you'll probably go to heaven. Probably. Where have we heard that before? How many times do you evangelize Catholics and you're preaching and they say, well, if my good outweighs my bad? Well, sir, let me assure you it won't. Okay? You're really evil and rotten, and it won't. Oh, my good. You know, you'll do a lot of good works if you think it's going to get you to heaven. You'll work as hard as you possibly can, and you will do the most wicked, awful things in the name of God to be saved. That's what kings did. That's what many kings did. They did the most awful, wicked, heinous things to Bible believers so the popes would forgive their sins. Muslims have no guarantee of being saved. Since God is all-powerful, they concede that he may do with you as he pleases, even if you have been very righteous. They hope he won't be having a bad day at judgment. Wow. Wow. Could you think about that for a second? So it's, their God is likened to a man. It's like, well, man, if he's having a bad day, I don't think I want to go that day. I want to stay home that day if I want to go. I mean, God's mad today. I think I'll stay away from there. That's, that's, do you see the mindset of humanism? It's just foolish. Because God's law is God's law in, in the Word of God. It's God's law, and that's as plain as that's what it is. It's not whether he's feeling like it. God doesn't work on emotions like that. That's not how, who God is. Okay, adding to this, uh, he won't be, that is if he doesn't have a bad day. A third possibility is that you could go to hell and burn your sins off for a while and then be allowed into heaven. What's that sound like? Well, where would they have got purgatory from? But they don't call it purgatory. You know what they call it? They call it barzakh. Not temporary, but relief is possible. This is not temporary hell. <laughs> they say on their websites, we do not believe in purgatory. But, <laughs> it's funny, it's, all of you look, if you study it, it's in all bold letters. We do not believe in purgatory. It's like they're yelling at you. <laughs> I'm not kidding you, Aaron. If you study, if you read it, okay, you go down like the website, the website, and they're like screaming at you in all caps. We do not believe in purgatory. We believe in berserk. Or Barzak or whatever. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what it's called. I'm not making fun of them. I'm really not. I just don't understand how to pronounce it. So anyway, uh, this is not a temporary hell. Hell is a fixed, permanent place. But Allah may allow some Muslims to be released from it because of his mercy. We believe that the Prophet will be allowed by Allah to intercede on behalf of some believers who are in hell. And by Allah's will, they will be taken out of hell. Allah will also take out of hell out of, out of the hell, some believers, not because someone has interceded on their behalf, but simply because he chooses to. Your simple question, this was a question that a Muslim asked another Muslim priest guy or whatever. Uh, your simple question then required a quite a complicated answer. In summary, as Muslims, we believe some wicked Muslims will be sent to hell for a limited time, for a limited time now. Uh, but ultimately will be granted paradise because of the mercy of Allah. Boy, that'd be real comforting to go into the hour of your death with, wouldn't it? Well, number one, I'm hoping he's in a good mood. <laughs> Just hoping he's happy. All right, N number two, he might decide I've done, my good might outweigh my bad, but I don't know what to measure that by. Now, where would they get these ideas from? Roman Catholicism. Come on, folks, this is nothing but Rome. That's all it is. It's Rome repackaged to Arabians. That's what it is. 
And it's duped them and it's fooled them for years. And I'm going to need a bodyguard by the time I'm finished with this. <laughs> Brother Paul. <laughs> That's right. Work salvation, though, will make a man do anything. If killing will give forgiveness of sins, then Rome had king is killed to receive pardon for sins. Jihad is a ticket to paradise with 72 virgins. First of all, I don't understand why any man would want 72 women around him in the first place like that. I'm not being mean. I'm just saying, I don't know how you could handle that. You know what I mean? I don't know if that's paradise. Anyway, they say this, from the most ancient times in the church... Good works were also offered. This is Roman Catholicism. Are you listening? From the most ancient times in the church, good works were also offered to God for the salvation of sinners, particularly the works which human weakness finds hard. Because the sufferings of the martyrs for the faith and for, and for God's law were thought to be very valuable, penitents, penitents used to turn to the martyrs to be helped by their merits, to obtain a more speedy reconciliation from the bishops. Indeed, the prayers and good works of holy people were regarded as of such great value that it could be asserted that the penitent was washed, cleansed, and redeemed with the help of the entire Christian people. Yeah. It's not, that's not Bible. That's not salvation. Salvation is by grace through faith. That's what salvation is. Salvation is turning to Jesus Christ and believing the gospel the finished work of Jesus Christ, what he did on Calvary. It's falling on my face and realizing I'm a wicked sinner before God and I can't do anything. There is no payment I can give for my sins. I can't wash them away. I can't work them away. I need forgiveness of sins. I need Jesus Christ. I need the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am altogether wicked. He is altogether holy. Amen. Next, Rome uses prayer beads and so does Islam. How about that? You you remember prayer beads, Dan? Did you use those prayer beads? You didn't have a necklace, did you, and hold that thing and rub them beads together, did you? Really? Oh, yeah, the, the, the what do they call them? The, help me out, Brother Andrew, you're Catholic. What is it? Rosary. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he was Lutheran. Same thing. Same thing, just you lost the beads. That's right. All right, these beads that, that Islam uses, the subha beads, are, are most often made of round, glass, wood, plastic, amber, or gemstone. The cord is usually cotton, nylon, or silk. There is a wide variety of colors and styles on the market, ranging from cheap, mass-produced prayer beads to those that are made with expensive materials and high-quality workmanship. The subha is used by Muslims to help count recitations and concentrate during personal prayers. The worshiper touches one beat at a time while reciting words, remembrance of Allah. These recitations are often of the 99 names of Allah, or of phrases that glorify and praise Allah. These, pra these phrases are most often repeated as follows. Now I want you to notice this. Want, would you notice these numbers here for a second? Now, I don't know if I'm going to say this right, but subhanallah, glory to Allah, they say that 33 times. Isn't that interesting, brother? 33 times. That number 33 is an interesting number. Then they say Alhamadala. Alhamadala. I thought they didn't like ham. It's spelled Alhamadala. It seriously is. I know I'm mutilating it, but that's how it's spelled. Praise be to Allah. That means 33 times. Ahula. Wait. Alu Akbar. Allah is great. 33 times. Now, does anybody remember what the Bible says about vain repetitions? Does anybody remember what the scriptures say? That the, be not as the heathens with their vain repetitions, that they're much speaking, they think that God will hear them. Now why would Islam have the same thing as Rome? Because Rome is the mom of Islam, that's why. That's why. It's patterned after the same thing. 
The form of the recitation stems from an account in which, in the Hadith, in which the Prophet Muhammad instructed his daughter Fatima to remember Allah using these words. He also said that believers who recite these words after every prayer will have all sins pardoned, even if they be as the large as the foam on the surface of the sea. Oh, so you mean it's kind of like rubbing your little beads together and say, Hail Mary? Remember, oh, yeah, I guess... I guess that's kind of the same. And you get sins forgiven when you rub those beads and you say your Hail Marys and your Our Fathers? Oh, okay. I mean, that's kind of, I've never been a Catholic before, but it is kind of weird. They take them into a booth, right? And then they say, we'll say this many Hail Marys and Our Fathers. Is that how that works? Why, how do they pick which number to say? Like how many to say? I see. Maybe they have a chart they go by. Is there a flow chart? <laughs> Sorry. Muslims may also use prayer beads to count multiple recitations of other phrases while in personal prayer. Some Muslims also carry the beads as a source of comfort, fingering them when stressed or anxious. Prayer beads are a common gift item, especially for those returning from haji. That's the pilgrimage, is that how you say it, Haji? How do you say that, Brother Paul? You were over there. How do you say that? Come on, man. I know we used to throw them our ham slices out of our MRE. You used to throw them ham slices? Yeah. That wasn't very nice of you. You shouldn't have told me that. You weren't saved. Well, at least you're being thoughtful and giving somebody some food. It's kind of nice. All right, number, I don't know next, whatever number it is. Rome has Christ being the final pope, and Islam has their 12th imam. Islam has this final leader that will come, this final world leader that will come. A majority of Shiite Muslims traditionally believe that the 12th imam, Islamic religious leader, born in 868 AD, was placed by God into hiding, known as oculation, O-C-C-U-L-T-A-T-I-O-N. Occultation? That doesn't sound good to put anybody in that. What's that? Yeah. Oh, thank you. All right, great. Until the Day of Judgment, Southern Baptist author and evangelist Shorush, he used to be a Muslim, explained that many Shiites also refer to the 12th Imam as the Mahdi, an Arabic word that generally references a Messiah or a guide. This man will come to show them the way because the prayer of every Muslim five times a day ends with, show us the right path. Not the path of those who have incurred your anger or those who are lost, but those upon whom grace has come, Shoros said. Though most strains of Islam have a belief in the Mahdi, Shiites traditionally believe he is Muhammad ibn Hazan, the twelfth in the line of Imams, who were descendants of the Prophet Muhammad. Though they do not know when the Mahdi will return, they believe he will come to the end of the misery of his people. Come to the end of the misery of his people. Some strains of Islam even hold a belief that Jesus will be the Mahdi who will return and proclaim Islam as the true religion. Well, now, if the Jesus that they have, what did Jesus say? He said, one will come in his own name and him you will receive. I'm telling you that I believe that 12th Imam will be the man, the Antichrist, the one that the world is looking for. Each culture is looking for, an, for a man to come. Each one of them talk about a man to come. Each one of them. That a man will come and he will fulfill that role. The belief that the belief in a savior is universal, BBC News quoted Ahmadinejad as saying in January, it is the pivot of our beliefs as Muslims and Iranians. We believe that an offspring of the prophet may... Uh, of offspring of the prophet, may peace be upon him, will be the ultimate savior. His name and attributes are clear. He will come and will administer ultimate justice. The belief that the Mahdi's return is near is not a new claim among Shiites, Wagner said, but one that has been held almost since the 12th Imam was historically placed into hiding. He went into hiding somewhere. Almost every generation has some figures in Islam that either claim to be the 12th Imam or claim that the 12th Imam will come to himself. By the way, when you look at the attributes, I was reading some of the things that talked about the attributes of this 12th imam and who he will be and what he will do. 
they say that he will be a master of numerology. They see he will be able to read minds. He will be able to predict future events. Everything that they start to describe about him is the same power that the Antichrist will have and, the, and a lot of the controls that he'll be able to have. And uh, anyway, so that 12th Imam and, and then the Pope, um, you know, I'll, I'll read you something here from Malachi. Anybody ever heard of Malachi Martin? Anybody ever heard of him? Some of you might have heard of him. Let me see here if I can find his quote. Oh, let me read you this, though. The Bible is the indispensable part of the furniture of the Christian Lodge, only because it is a sacred book of the Christian religion, the Hebrew Pentateuch in the Hebrew Lodge, and the Koran in the Mohammedan one, belong on the altar. And one of these, and the square and the compass, properly understood are the great lights by which a mason must walk and work. How is the Koran by that light? <clears throat> which they must walk and work by. That's kind of scary, isn't it? But anyway, that's what they believe. I'm looking for one other one. Let me see if I can find it here. I want to read it to you if I can find it. Uh, let's see. I'll check my email. I want to read this by Malachi Martin and what he said because I found it kind of fascinating in what he said about it. Let's see. Let's see if I can find it. No. Let's see. Yeah, Vatican insider Dr. Malachi Martin has said that based on the message of Mary and a personal visitation, John Paul believes there will come a day when the heart of Islam, already attuned to the figures of Christ and of Christ's mother Mary, will receive the illumination it needs. Now, when you hear that word illumination like that, that's a code word for the occult. Okay, understand that. The way it's used there, that's always a code word. For the most part. Illumination it needs. A second Fatima in which they will recognize him as God's vicar on earth. Then will fellow travelers. Now that right there is interesting language too. Because that fellow travelers. Who knows where that, that saying comes from. Freemasonry. Fellow traveler. Fellow traveler. Right? Freemasonry. Then will fellow travelers like the Church of England, the Episcopal Church, and others of like mind, the Pope could be worshipped as the infallible Holy Father by over one half of the world's population. See, all he's waiting for is that worldwide worship. That's what he wants. And you know, one of the last identifying factors that we see between Rome and Islam is the murder of Christians. The murder of true Bible-believing Christians will happen all over the world and has happened all over the world by both Muslims and by Rome. Why? Well, first of all, they made a deal to do that. The Pope made a deal a long, long time ago. They made a deal that they would kill and eradicate Christians, but, but most Roman Catholics will not be eradicated. Now, there's some that are being killed because the Pope will sacrifice his own people. He doesn't care. He doesn't care about that. He would kill anybody. He'd kill his mother if he had to. He didn't care. But um, Islam was the weapon of the Pope that he used to kill Jews and Christians down through the centuries. True Christians were murdered by Rome. And one of the identifying factors that you see a hate for Jesus Christ and a hate for the Bible, Christianity, a hate for this book, you find that in Revelation chapter 17, verse number 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. They have a hate for, for Christians. They have a hate for Bible-believing Christians. They just do. Your upper-level ones do. They, they, they have an absolute hate for it, and they want to destroy it. Why? Because you don't worship Allah. You will not serve their God. You will not fall by the sword. And they believe in conquering by the sword. That's what they believe. They don't believe that salvation is between you and, you and God. They believe that they can force it through the sword. That's what they believe. And that's what they want to do. But that's not what the scriptures tell us to do. The scriptures tell us to plead with men, to go out and preach the gospel. You know, we get it's funny, we've seen people compare us, oh, that's just like I had one guy stop by and he was in the military and I was preaching where Paul, we were up north, we we're up in the city somewhere, and I was preaching and this 
this soldier came. I just got back from where was it? Afghanistan. I just got back from Afghanistan, and and you remind me of the people that I was shooting and uh, shooting and fighting over there because of religion. I said, really? Because I don't have a gun in my hand, and I'm not trying to kill anybody. I've got a Bible in my hand, if you want to call this. This is that spiritual 66 caliber right here. This will do some damage. Yeah, it sure will. And that man was looking at me with hate and disgust, and I just took my Bible out, and I said, you know, I pointed it, and I preached to him. And I told him, you know, you might have done some things in the name of your country over there, but that doesn't mean God approved of it. And you're just, yeah. No, no, of course not. Yeah. When you see a soldier like that and you see some of the men that are out there today and the way they look at you in their eyes and the way they talk to, to American citizens and the way they feel about them, they'd, t they'd stick a knife in your back in a second, a lot of them would. Because they've been trained to do it. They've been conditioned to do it. Not all of them, but a great number of them. And they would obey their government before their God. And they would slaughter Bible-believing Christians in a heartbeat. Do you realize that we in this country, by the grace of God, we are the only people that stand between judgment? And if you and I don't stand in the gap and tell the truth, and I'm going to use this thing of free speech and use this thing of, of the First Amendment for as long as I can and get out as much truth over that Internet and get out as much truth about that and try to warn the billions of Muslims that are stuck in a false pagan, a cult, occultic religion that is a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. It is the mother of all secrets. It is the trick. They've been bamboozled. They've been fooled by the devil. It is the same thing as Babylon repackaged to the Arabian people. And then you have the nation of Islam of black Muslims in America. And they're lost and dying in their sins. They've been fooled. They've been duped. They've been tricked. You have the Hebrew Israelism. You have all these different groups out there that they've been fooled. They don't know what the Bible says. They don't have any authority with the scriptures. And the Bible is plainly plainly speaks against them. So why do we why do we show these distinctions and why do we show these things? Because maybe it'll give you just a little bit more to help somebody with. Maybe it'll educate you a little bit on how you could help somebody. But if your Christianity is just all about you then you don't care. I've had some people say, oh, you don't preach Jesus enough. I preach Jesus every week. I don't know what you're talking about. It's just I'm not going to preach the, a gospel message and give an invitation for people that are already born again. And, they, and, they, and you know what? If you're not saved and you're here, you'll, you'll definitely get enough Holy Spirit Scripture thrown at you and enough of the, of the, of the, the, the Spirit-bearing witness. As in, look at, look at um, uh, Louise in the back there. See, we're, we're so shallow, we actually believe that, that it's us doing it. She, listened, she came every week and she listened to a sermon that was preached three years ago. A bunch of them. Why do we think that we can limit God so much that you can't teach about other things or you can't educate people into the into things so they so they grow so they know a little bit more than singing Jesus loves me to somebody? Because you know what I see those people every week out on the street and they don't know anything about the Bible. They're lost and dying in their sins and they can't explain anything to you. All they walk around and do is sing that same Sunday school song that your little kid got taught when he was five years old. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves everybody. Jesus loves everybody. Jesus loves everybody. That's all they repeat. God loves everybody. Don't judge. God loves everybody. Judge not. <laughs> judge not. God loves everybody. God loves everybody. Judge not. God loves everybody. They sound like a vain repetition. That's all they do. And they sip the little cute signs. They should have, oh, see, judge not. Oh, well, then now I'm done. I'm not going to say anything now because you, you see those two words. I'm done now. I, can't, I don't even know what to say to you because you said judge not. I mean, but that's what you run into. Why? Because pastors don't teach anything. So now maybe if you run across a Muslim, you can give them some information. Maybe you could have some things on CD. Maybe you could give it to them and you could say, hey, why don't you take this home and listen to it? It might, some things might make you mad, but listen to it all the way through and think about it. After all, it's only their soul. 
But you know what? More people in America would rather see those Muslims go to hell than go to heaven. They would rather see them blown up or shot up because they think every single Muslim is trying to kill them in the world. And it's not true. They're just not. Some people like living here. Some people like to, they, they like nice things. Some, some of them are just like you. All this hate for either Jews or Muslims or black people or white people or, or, or Indians or, or, or whoever. All this hate. It's nothing to do with the scriptures. Amen. It's not biblical. The Bible says that you love one another. You ought to love a man enough. If you really believe he's wrong, then preach the Bible to him and tell him the truth that he can be saved. Preach the truth to him. That's what they need. They need that, that Muslim. That one day, there's a video of me dealing with a Muslim up in Minneapolis, and he was telling us that we were doing it wrong. And I always love it when a, you know, everybody tells you you're doing it wrong, but when a Muslim man comes up to Christians and tells them that you're preaching Jesus wrong, I mean that's just pretty amazing. <laughs> that's just pretty amazing. <laughs> but he come, so I straightened him out and I told him the truth. But watch the video. Can you give an answer to them? That's why we're commanded to give an answer. So study, learn. That's what we're doing this for. I want to help some people that are stuck in these mystery religions, these cults and everywhere. I've got, I've got a burden for those people that are stuck in these places. They need, If it's not for men that talk about things like this, there's a lot of guys out there that wouldn't even be saved because some people had the thought enough to tell them and to warn them. The things on witchcraft and the druids and all those things, it's because, that's why we do it. Because there's people out there that everybody thinks they're done. Oh, they served idols. They, they serve a false god. They can't be saved. Or they're in witchcraft. Well, remember I preached that message on Hezekiah or uh, Manasseh? How deep Manasseh was? He did everything against God. And he fell on his knees and he repented after God chastened him. And he was forgiven. And your son can be, your daughter can be, your friends can be, family members can be. No, it's not too late. As long as there's breath. And these people need to be reached that are stuck in cults. But you know what? They end up going to some spooky charismatic churches because Baptists don't want them there. Because Baptists think something's wrong with them when they come in because they, they get saved and they're, they're, it's awkward for them to be there because they didn't grow up wearing a suit and a tie and, and doing everything perfect. They didn't grow up that way. Not that there's anything against a suit and a tie. I'm just saying. But Paul always looks better than me. He's always dressed up. Lee's not, and he's a banker. He's supposed to be. I don't know what's wrong with him. What are we doing with this? Listen, we got, we got, we got Brother Paul's electrician, and you're a banker. And he's got it right here. That's why he's, that's why he's running the street preaching right there. No, I appreciate Brother Paul. He's got a burden. But you know what? Brother Paul has the same burden for people. He'll go out and talk to those people. He's talked to plenty of Muslims. He talked to a Muslim man in front of a, a, a liquor store. Man, I wish you would have had that on tape, brother. I'd love to have seen that. But he talked to that man, tried to reach that man. He's a Somali, wasn't he? Yeah, tried to reach him. Why? Because he doesn't hate him. You know how many Christians? You know why they think that Christians hate them? That's what they think in their mind. Most of them think that. And Christians, these, these people are nuts. They want to kill everybody. What would you feel if you've seen on the news where people are doing that? What? Yeah, because the Catholics, right? And then, and then the war machine. Yeah. No, they they just hate us. No, I don't hate you, man. I've told them that. I've told Muslims I don't hate you, man. I don't hate you. You need to be saved. All right, let's. Go. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Lord, I pray for these billions of Muslims that are out there, Lord, that need to be saved. Lord, they need to be delivered from darkness, translated in the kingdom of light. Lord, help us to be able to reach them. Help us to be able to reach others for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us to be able to reach these Roman Catholics, Lord. We don't hate Roman Catholics either, Lord. We're not mad at Roman Catholic people. Lord, we're like Charles Chiniqui. He dedicated his book, 50 Years in the Church of Rome, to the Roman Catholic people because he wanted them to be saved. But Lord, we hate the damnable, wicked papacy and the wickedness that it's wrought and the and the wickedness of the black pope and the pope over there and all the Jesuit order and all that they've done, Lord. And we just pray. We know someday, Lord, you're going to break that. But Lord, we pray that we would be able to chip away at the devil's kingdom. 
and that you would use us to bring some sons to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Paul's best, like the vice president of the church. That's it.